just in case, all right? What to do if you are bit by a snake? First of all, stay away from snakes. That was, that was some great advice there. <laughs> stay away from snakes. Number two, don't panic and don't move. Number three, lay or sit the person down with the bite below the level of heart. Number four, leave the snake alone. <laughs> Five, wash the wound with warm soap water, soapy water immediately. And six, cover the bite with a clean dressing. So the whole thing of, of sucking out the poison and cutting open the wound, just I'm not a doctor, but I'm just saying that's it's really not what it's about. I mean, you, then you've got a cut and a snake bite you heal from. So don't do that. Um, when I think about snakes, we talked about this, and I don't want to revisit too much. Maybe you can go back and listen or, or watch the videos. Um, we talked about how in the garden uh, there was the snake, the serpent, uh, the evil one. In fact, it's, it's not really so much that it was a serpent, but that the fact that at one point he, he had legs, Lucifer, Satan, the one that was flung down from heaven. He had legs, and then part of his curse was that he would no longer have legs. The Bible says that Satan is an, an angel of light. Like if he showed up the way we saw everybody last night and some tonight, pitchfork horns and everything else, you know, then, then that would be a little bit easier. But Satan shows up as light. He shows up in a form that doesn't seem as it is, very much like snakes do sometimes when they're in their natural habitat. And we see in the garden this iridescent creature, would later be known as a dragon in Revelation, that man was bitten by the rebellion of Satan. And the poison of that sin was injected into our very nature so that every one of us was infected with the venom of pride and rebellion. I'm thinking about the snake hurts. The snake will use the momentum of the strike, both unexpected, both from an isolated place or from a secluded place. Oftentimes, you don't even know that they are there until you've already been hit. I think about the way that snakes and the poison of sin works in our own life. This particular snake, the python, uses the strike to throw its weight towards, and then very quickly she would wrap her coils around the victim. Note the victim is not dead at this point or even injected with poison. She's not poisonous. She's just got some pretty heinous bacteria in her teeth. Her job as a python is not to inject poison. Her job is to strangle and constrict the life out of her target. In fact, experts say that it's the increased pressure, dramatically high pressure, and she would increase the blood pressure of her prey that actually causes the expiration. That the pressure that she exerts is greater than the pressure that that target's body would exert. Therefore, everything inside just ceases to operate as it initially would. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Dr. Luke, the same one that wrote Luke, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, shares with us this story. I thought it was pretty neat that he considered it important to put into the text. This is Paul and Silas. Maybe you're familiar with them, known as missionaries. And they're on a missionary journey. And this is what he records. As we were going to the place of prayer, this is Paul speaking, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain fortune telling. Now, that word divination uh, is a Greek word uh, called, called pumon, uh, where we get the word python. This is uh, divination is used several times throughout the text, but this specific word is only used right here. Now, some Christian circles say that because of that, there is a demon spirit whose name is Python, and they will stand against or they will pray against the spirit of Python. I'm here to say I don't know if that's uh, theologically sound, but what is sound is the fact that the way a python works into our life and the way the enemy works into our lives is very much the same way. What I am to say is that that's what the word is, that's what that specific Greek word is in the Bible, and that is a python. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. Let me back up because I didn't read that part. It says... Um, she followed Paul and us, crying out, These servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. 
And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, greatly annoyed, angered, frustrated, what that word means, turned and said to the spirit, I command you. So that's where we, it's, it's a specific thing, right? It's not just, uh, you know, as, as Jesus would tell, you know, Peter behind Satan. It, it specifically speaks of lowercase s right here. And he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. I told you about this fool with some crazy stories if you read it as it is. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. So I'm going to skip all this. Uh, you continue to read. What happens is they get arrested. They get put into jail, Paul and Silas. This is also where we get the story that they were uh, in the jail in the middle of the night, and they were singing, and along came this great big massive earthquake and shook everybody loose. And the jailer came in and saw he thought everybody was gone. It was dark, and he was about to kill himself. And they said, hold up. We're still here. And then they led the guy to the Lord from their worship in the middle of an unjust situation, unjust situation, in the middle of a hard situation, in the middle of a storm for them. And yet the Bible says that they continued to pray and sing spiritual songs. There's something very interesting about the breath of God when I think of the breath of God. We see it in Genesis first and foremost when breathed into man the, the breath of God and there was life. We're talking about the life that God gives, the life that God would give us today, the life that God would give you every morning. So there is the physical breath that we have that has the oxygen in it that we need. And then there's also something to be said about the literal life sustaining that God does in giving us breath. How many of you know you didn't wake yourself up this morning? Have you ever thought about what makes your heart beat? I mean, I know there's some, some, some educated people in the room. I understand the electricity and, and what all happens there, but where does that electricity come from? Where does the firing of all of that come from? Where's the power source? I can tell you where the power source is. It's from the one that breathed life. The breath of God gives life. The breath of God always gives life. Job said it this way in chapter 34. He said, if God were to take back his and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. Acts 17 says, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs. Speaking of God, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. Somebody hear that today. He gives life and breath and he satisfies every need. And then Acts 2 says, and suddenly at the launch and the birthing of the church and the Holy Spirit says, Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. The wind of God, the breath of God that would breathe life into his people and breathe life into his church. Where does the enemy attack whenever he attacks? Are you under a spiritual attack? And keep in mind, I'm not talking about the absence of discipline. I'm not talking about the absence of the grit sometimes that it takes to go ahead and roll out of bed if you're going to seek the Lord in the early or stay up a little bit later even though your eyes are heavy or step away from lunch in the name of fasting and seeking the Lord. Those things are disciplined things. But sometimes we cannot deny that we come under, as God's people, a spiritual attack. If you look at this story of Paul, one of the things that had happened is he had just led a really amazing woman named Lydia to the Lord. And we don't know chronologically how this thing was laid out, but, but he leads Lydia to the Lord, and then immediately now this other thing happens and starts following him around. And it seems like what she was saying is not a bad thing, right? She's saying, these men are serving God, and they come to proclaim the gospel. But she wasn't saying it as in, hey, everybody, I need to listen to these guys. She's like full of sarcasm, right? I think we need like a sarcasm and mode that we can put on social media because some people don't get it, and then some people take it way too far, <laughs> And sometimes I don't know. I'm like, are they being sarcastic or are they real? I don't know. I'm really concerned either way. I'm just saying she was being super sarcastic and it become very annoying. How I many of you know that whenever something really gets to a place that it's picking at you and that's bothering you, whether it be somebody or something, if that thing has permission into your heart, into your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, uh, into your mind, all of a sudden, whether we believe it or not, at that moment, they have control of your emotions, and the life flow of God is starting to creep away. So what happens to believers whenever they 
saved and they're on fire and they're sharing the gospel with me. I ran into I ran to Jesus at the Alma football game on Friday night. That was pretty amazing. His name was Benjamin. I said, I thought his name was Jesus. And he began to talk to me immediately right out of the gate, just about asking where you go to church at, and just kind of sharing some stuff and talked about his family he used to go to church, but they're kind of looking for a church. And, and we began to share, but he said, Man, I really I know I need to get back in church. I said, Yeah, Jesus needs to be in church. You might ought to think about it. And then I met this other guy, and he was walking by. I was just out there taking pictures of, some, of, the, of the crew that was working. And he was like, man, what church are y'all from? And he was like, man, God saved me. And he's like, you know, 15-year-old student. And he said, God saved me. And tell me what church he goes to. And he said, he just, he just rocked my world. He was fired up about what God had done in his life. I remember I heard stories of somebody that said when somebody gets saved and then they, they're fired up about God and, 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 and recognizing the grace and everything that God has done, love and the freedom that we have in Christ. And then somebody would say, they'll wear off after a little while. You'll calm down. Hmm. I'm here to say God would say, no, I need to stir you up. You need some life. And life don't always look like exuberant praise and life doesn't always look like some things of the, the, the emotional worship and excitement that, that, that some circles may seek after. I'm talking about the life that sustains even in the middle of darkness. The life that'll push through even in hard conversations. The life that'll push into the real stuff about Christianity. And I can assure you it does not happen in here. It happens at your house. It happens at your workplace. It happens up here in your mind. The anti-venom is given here. The anti-venom is given by Scripture and your word. But the life flow that Jesus would give us goes further than the thresholds of those doors whenever we leave here on Sundays or Wednesdays. That's a great place to say amen, somebody. So the question is this. Are you under spiritual attack? What does that look like to be under spiritual attack? I don't know. I'm not going to answer that for you. Are you completely exhausted? Don't answer that because the whole room would say yes. Why? Why are you exhausted all the time? Why are you so spent? We, spent, we talked about this several weeks ago, a couple months ago, actually, about being busy. And being busy is not the right thing. And so I added this little addendum. When see people say, how have you been doing? What you been up to? I said, I've been busy, but it's been a good kind of busy. Not just busy. I'm not just building something for nothing. Like we're building. We're working on God's kingdom. God's building his church, and he's using, God, he's using our hands and our feet and your voice and my voice and other voices and stories and testimonies for his glory. That's what he does. But if you find yourself consistently and always exhausted spiritually, you might be under attack. If you can't breathe, if you recognize that, that there has been a, a great degradation of your spiritual walk, you could just be the prodigal son out doing his own thing. I don't know. But if you'll notice in the beginning of this text, it says they were on their way to pray. And if you aren't praying like you used to pray, good chance. That's the first place the enemy's going to attack is the way that you communicate with God and the, the frequency in which you communicate with God. And as I said earlier, we often think, well, I wish I could pray like this or pray like that. And my friend, you just talk to God like you're talking to a friend. Now, he's God, and he's majestic, and we stand in awe, and he's not your bro. But he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so the enemy's gonna, he's going to try to suffocate your prayer life out. It's exactly what he's trying to do here with Paul and Silas. And somehow, if we're not careful, we'll get injected with through life and things that happen in life, just the poison of bitterness and unforgiveness, even familiarity, the stuff you get comfortable with and just say, well, you know, this, you, know you, you take for granted the giftings or you take for granted the blessing of God or you take for granted, fill in the gap for yourself, the poison of bitterness and anger. So how does it kill? How, how does, how does a, a, a snake, a, a python, a constrictor, how does a constrictor kill? Well, it, as I said earlier, it doesn't desire to destroy. It just wants to restrict and squeeze the life out of its target by removing the life flow. In other words, you can have structure as long as you don't have life. 
So in other words, you can have a church building, but not have life. You can have giftings, but not have an anointing. You can be called, but not be empowered, because you have to have the flow of life. You can have words, but not have any action. You got to be in the flow of God, the flow of power, per se. And I don't, you know, it's, it's the dynamite, like it changes things. That's what that means whenever we receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes on us. Not the power to run through walls, power to do foolish emotional things, but the power to share the gospel into dark places. The power to wrestle with. Make sure she's over there. The power to wrestle with things that constrict and things that will literally struggle and, and, and strain the life out of who you are. Have you ever been deprived of oxygen? You know what that feels like? Have you ever been down in the water and then you're coming up? I remember one time I was in the ocean and had gone down real deep to just look at some stuff and it was deeper than I thought and the water is so clear I was getting to the top, and I thought I was there, but I wasn't, and I still had several more feet to go before I got there, and I was like literally, you know, involuntarily, you, your body will either pass out and breathe, or it'll, it'll go up on its own, and that was, a, that was a very real moment for me when I realized how close I was to something possibly happening to a guy that can swim well and was under no attack whatsoever, but because I was deprived of oxygen, everything almost changed. And should we find ourselves wrapped in the coils of the enemy, whether it be through the hurts and pain, the sins that entangle, or whatever that may be, I'm just going to say that when you're deprived of oxygen, you can do some crazy things. You can begin to hallucinate if you are void of oxygen. Your body will begin to shut down. I've seen people that are saved by the sacrifice of Christ. They have tasted this amazing grace. They know what it's like to stare hell in the face and, and, and just kind of plant their feet and put up their shield of faith and breastplate of righteousness and belt of truth and sword of the spirit, and helmet of salvation, shoot, shoes with the gospel and preparation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're standing there and they're ready. Those same people, I've seen them say things like, I don't even want y'all no more. I'm going back to my friends in the world. They was nice as they guys were. Now, think about that for a second. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people that are heathens. I mean, I mean, I don't mean derogatory. I'm just saying like people that don't know the Lord. I'm not saying that there aren't some nice people. I've known people. I'm like, really, all you got to do is believe. You really ain't got, it's, I think you're sanctified already. You just need to believe in Jesus and get on to heaven. <laughs> now, they exist. But that's also my morality thinking, too. The fact of the matter is we are all sinners. No matter how good our morality is, that's not the point. If you broke one of the laws, you go through breaking all of them, the Bible says. So the fact of the matter is, whether it's a grandmother or somebody that's committed the most atrocious sin, whatever you think that would be, everybody's equally needing Jesus the same way, including everybody in this room. You don't need him worse than me, and I don't need him worse than you. We both just need him really, really, really bad. And I've seen people, because of the, I believe, the, the constricting effects of sin and just, just the way the enemy will play our mind, maybe because of lack of life, they'll begin to believe stuff. It's not even the truth. Like, how come you don't remember the way those friends accepted you until you didn't agree with them anymore? Or the way they just cut you off and walked away? Or the way they've word vomited on you? Or the way that they, uh, you know, launched the heinous attacks against you? How come you don't remember those things? But all of a sudden, Christians, people that love the Lord or have loved the Lord, and all of a sudden, everything is changing in their life. You know what's going to satisfy What's going to satisfy your reach is the same thing that was satisfying me when my head popped that water in that ocean. It was full supply of life. At that time for me, it was oxygen as much as I could inhale and as quickly as I could inhale it. But I will tell you this, while I was trying to find oxygen, I was focused on nothing else. There was nothing else I was looking at. I wasn't looking at family, career, my walk with the Lord. If there were sharks in the water or not in the water or whatever crab I was chasing at the time, I was literally only trying to find oxygen. And I just wonder if there's any Christians in the room today who would say, that's all I'm really trying to do is survive. And if that's what's going on, then there may be a chance. I'm just asking the question. 
What are we looking for? What are you reaching for at this very moment right now? Because what Lucy's going to do is she's going to wrap around real quick. That's not her name. I named her that this morning. I didn't even realize it. And then Lauren said, oh, Lucifer, I get it. I said, no, I really wasn't even thinking about that. Lucy just fit. I must be anointed today. I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm sorry. It slips out sometimes. Um, All jokes aside, as we're reaching for what she does is she wraps around. And every time you go to breathe and take a breath, she constricts a little harder. That's what they do. When you when you hold her. And I, I met the guy last night that owns her, Brad, is a really amazing guy. And guy's like, I've, 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 I've caught snakes before. I, I'm okay with it. But when he, the last time I saw her three years ago, she wasn't this big. And he pulled her out of this box. And I was just sitting there at the gas station with my hands in my pockets like, oh, Lord, are you sure about this? And God said, it's not my idea that you're, you're on your own, you know. But when I grabbed the pole, I'm like, all right, dude, man up. Here you go, man up, grab the snake. And so I, I grabbed the snake. I didn't do that. I was doing that in my mind. Like I was psyching myself up. I'm like, come on, you got to do this thing, you know. And I'm already knowing I'm not going to handle her today because people got, you know, they're going to talk anyway. And, and we're going to put her back underneath the baptistry and we're done. We'll just stay there. Don't worry about it. it she won't be out every Sunday. <laughs> but I grabbed her, and you can literally feel every muscle move as it moves through your hands. And when she comes around her target, she just constricts, and then they take a breath. And as they exhale, when things get smaller, she constricts again. And you know, she's not in any hurry. She hadn't eaten for a month. I asked him last night, I said, when was the last time she ate? He, she said, I don't know, like a month ago. I'm like, don't you think she's hungry? Can we throw her a, something? <laughs> you know, a chipmunk? I don't care. <laughs> just, I don't need it to be me. <laughs> um... So sometimes in your Christian walk, you know, you can get strapped and you're like, okay, I'm good. What you don't realize is that it's still there. You've just exhaled, and now it's harder to breathe the next time. And it's harder to breathe the next time. And it's harder to breathe the next time. Is that how your prayer life is? Is that how your word study is? Is that what's going on? Like you're literally just trying to breathe every week after week after week. And here comes Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday's easier, Sunday. I don't know if we're going to do it or not. We might, we might not. And then Monday, here we go again. Is that what life is? Does that sound like life and life more abundant to you? It doesn't mean. And I'm telling you, I'm not coming at you like I'm talking to me. I'm saying there is more to life than just trying to breathe. There's more to life than just struggling in and out and in and out and in and out. I got to hurry. So why would the enemy attack our prayer walk, our work, spiritual hunger, uh, the isolation attack that happens? We see it all the time, even in COVID, for good reason. Some people aren't able to be out and among, and that's the wisdom that they would put over their life, and that needs to happen. But the isolation and the effects of that, the pride attack, the vision attack, if any of those things aren't firing as they have done in your life in the past, then maybe I would suggest what Paul told young Timothy when he said, fan into flame the gifts that God gave you at the laying on of hands. When you were saved, somebody came along beside of you and they put their arm around you. They put their hand on your chest or on your shoulder or on the back of your head. Maybe on the top of your head, I don't know, but they laid hands, they prayed, and we rejoiced that we had received this beautiful gospel that would change and revolutionize our life and the life of the world. Why would he do that? Why would that be a big deal? Well, first of all, because prayer and the word is power. Your surrender, the power of God's word, spills out into power in your life. Not the kind of power like the soulish stuff, not the carnal stuff. Not like the power to, to do what I want to do. You can have the right to do it and then not be the right thing. And even in that, with the prayer and the word, all of a sudden you have grace that is sufficient. And now I can have the power to not do even what I know I can do because it's not the right thing at this time. So now I have the power to slow my roll and hold up. Or maybe maybe you want to step into that, but yeah, I don't know. I don't really feel a peace and God will give you the grace to say, okay, how do you know that you've been in? I'm going to go back to what it said for us. I'm going to rattle through these real quick, guys. You can write them down, and then I've got to get to the final of this. So how do you know you've been bit? Number one, you know, what do you do after you're bit? You stay away from snakes. 
You gotta resist the devil and he'll flee, James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. If you're not resisting, you've probably been bit. If she gets around you, guess where you're not going? Away from her. Doesn't matter. And as I said earlier, she's got time. You know what also has plenty of time? The spiritual attack. You know, demons have no concept of time. The same demons that went after your grandfather and your great-grandfather, your father, a good chance that they're still, especially that's why the Bible talks about the, the generations to generations, the blessing that we sang. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so important for you to understand what banner is over your family because the blessing of God flows. It goes on down. Why? Because the life of God flows, because life gives birth to life. And if I'm giving life to my family in, in the God sense, then it sets my family up. It doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean they're going to, not going to struggle at times and all those kinds of things. But that's the way that works. I know I bit off a chunk there. Send me an email if, 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 if you want to visit that a little more. Don't panic and don't move. If you've been bit, don't panic and don't move. Isaiah 41.10 says, don't be afraid for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. It said, lay or sit the person down with the bite below the level of the heart. If you've been bit, the last thing you need to do is suppress the Jesus in your life, but that's what we do. What you really need to do is lift up the name of Jesus above everything that's going on, above everything that's encamped around you. Circumstance is circumvented or circum where the circle standing. Circumstances circumstanding around. I'm standing in the middle of this. <laughs> the other one, they said, leave the snake alone, Galatians 5, 16. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. And it said to wash the wound. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then it says, cover the bite with a clean, dry dressing. Listen to what Psalm said in 91. They don't have it, none of these back there. I'm just going to read them to you. It says, this I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. What a powerful word. Psalm 91, too. Be a great one to put to memory. Every year, nearly 100,000 people around the world die from a venomous snake bite. Depending on the toxicity of that venom and how much venom is injected into the body, snake bite can cause tingling, muscle weakness, nausea, swallowing, difficulties, excess saliva, potentially fatal breathing problems. When I was looking at, you know, what does the answer to this thing look like? Don't stick your tongue out at me. And recognizing what trying to breathe looks like. Recognizing that we all have been wrapped into wrong things at some point or another. That poison of bitterness and anger and rage, and sin that entangles and chains, and jealousy, and hatred, all this kind of stuff. Knowing that my brother had gotten bit by that moccasin and the anti-venom and the way all that works, Dose of anti-venom is, is like $25,000 $25, for the anti-venom. I don't know. Is it worth it? I don't know. Might be if you got snake bit. I told the guy, I said, if she bites me, I don't need any venom. I, I'm gone anyway. I'm a heart attack. I'm out. <laughs> See y'all when you get there. <laughs> I got to looking up anti-venom and what it's made from. And I saw this one time and I was like, no, 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 that can't be the case. That can't be true. I did some research and found out that it is absolutely true. You know what preferred blood is used to create anti-venom? Lamb's blood. Horses and lamb's blood. All different kinds of blood can be used. Horse's blood, the problem is, is when it's injected into people, a lot of people are allergic to horses. The molecules within the horse also causes an adverse reaction, and there's a lot of different side effects from an antivenom made from horse blood. What well, tends to not be the case with lamb's blood. 
Isn't it amazing how science is always catching up to God? Science is always following what God created. They're just discovering what has already been. They don't create anything. You can't create anything from nothing. So they're always using the elements that God created. I could go on, but we don't have time. So then we have the poison of sin and rebellion and pride. Stand with me all over the room. I'll ask you a couple questions. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 1, verse 6. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Somebody say believes. Romans goes on to say in Romans chapter 3, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. My friends, the antidote for sin has been and always will be the blood of a lamb. And just as John the Baptist said, as Jesus was walking down the side of the river and John was baptizing people into repentance, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As we said earlier in John, it says that it cleanses us from our sin. Just like the antibodies that are injected into us, it absolutely attacks and extrapolates from and heals the same way falling into the sacrifice of Christ and receiving that gift and believing that Jesus died for our sins is the beginning of the healing that your heart longs for. It is the only antidote for the things that plague. And should you find yourself wrapped in some coils today, the antidote is Jesus. It ain't even a sermon with a crazy illustration. And it's not that right song and it's not even that right scripture except that it would illuminate truth it is you having that relationship with jesus and calling out our desperation and humility and saying i am poisoned and i am in need of an antidote and i believe that antidote is jesus and in that believing we repent and we turn and we walk away and we walk away and we resist the snake and we resist the coils and we resist all of what that is and we fall completely and fully into his marvelous grace Every head bowed and every eye closed is my question today. As he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness in Christ Jesus, I need to know today, is there anybody that has never trusted that sacrifice and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know that today the Lord has been talking to your heart and you are tired of being wrapped up and you're tired of the poison having an effect into your life time and time and time again. And you need to surrender your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want to ask you to raise your hand. And we're going to pray in this room. I want you to raise it high. I need to give my heart to Jesus. Amen, brother. Heaven just shouted, church. Now for the rest of us. I really don't even have to say anything. How many of you would just say, yes, God, and lift your hand? Yes, God. Whatever he said, whatever it may be, yes, God. Somebody whisper the name of Jesus. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You cannot muscle your way out of this. By the spirit of God.
Let's pray together and pray with this brother that raised his hand and maybe there were some others and we're going to pray out loud and we're going to just rejoice in a rebirth. Say, Father, I come to you now. Humbly knowing I need a Savior. I believe that Savior is Jesus and that he died on the cross for my sins. That he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And right now he sits at the right hand of my father praying for me. I turn from my ways and I fix my faith on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. I give you my life. I give you my mind. I give you my heart. Take seat. O oh, Lord of my life, I surrender to you forever. Now, Father, to every hand that was raised, I pray freedom in the name of Jesus. There is only one name by which we can be saved, even from the coils and the snare of sin, whether it be an attack, whether it be a habit, whether it be a thought process or a continual rut. Lord, I pray for life to flow and breath that leads to life and life more abundant through the Lord Jesus Christ. We surrender to you. Have your way on this campus for the rest of this evening. Let our work be done as a response to our faith that we have been gloriously saved and redeemed and set free. And we give you thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. 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 Whew, that was fun. I believe that God did speak to hearts. I know He's been speaking to mine all week long. Um, I'm going to keep kicking these scriptures around. I believe that it has something to do with also the revival that we're going into. Guys, I'm telling you, I know revivals aren't done a whole lot, but we need you to be here. This is your church. This is our church. It's what God is calling us to do. Um, one more scripture that I'll read to you right quick in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. He's speaking of the Antichrist. But when it's all said and done, the Lord Jesus Christ will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. That breath, that life flow, just when the enemy thinks that it's over with, the life flow of God comes back in. And I believe that's what's happened in hearts today. I believe somebody was just to the top and about to gulp the wrong thing. And God gave life. And to the young brother that raised his hand and anybody else, I'm going to be down here and I would love to meet with you and talk to you about what the steps of a disciple look like moving forward. Try to help you get plugged into the right people. Let's do that. Guys, talk about what God did in your heart and your life today. It's powerful. Your story is powerful. The story that you have is powerful. Uh, brother Jesse, if you'll come and grab Miss Lucy and get her back in her box for all of eternity. <laughs> Don't set it on fire. We've got to give her back to our friend Brad. She is pretty awesome, and it's amazing, you know, God's creation. Uh, I don't mind looking at her from a distance. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> Pastor Cody likes Lucy. He does good. Don't forget tonight, uh, for everybody doing Fall Fest and Trunk or Treat, uh, you can check with Tammy in the back. Let her know so that we can have your spaces whenever you get here. Uh, when you arrive on campus, we'll have some barriers set up. Just wait right there, and we'll have somebody directing you guys to come around. Uh, don't forget everybody that's on the hayride. Uh, be here at 2 o'clock. If you want to stay around afterwards, uh, many of us will be here just tying up some loose ends. Feel free to hang around and be a part of that. Uh, don't be doing that. Man. Oh, she's like, hold on, Jesse. I'll have you, bro. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. I told you guys, she's strong. Yep. All right. She's just trying to get. Thank you, sir. All right. 
Everybody say, bye, Lucy. <laughs> She's going to go wait in my truck, and so nobody, we're not going to do any of that. We're not. Um, yeah, there's a little thing called liability, and uh, we're not stepping into that. But I, I thank you guys for your patience. Thank you for trusting. My, that's a big deal, and I, I recognize that. Um, but that just the idea it just really spoke to my heart. It has been now for some time. So uh, let me pray one more time. Father, thank you for what you did in hearts and lives today, for your spirit that is at work and moving here and across our state, our nation, even around the world, God. We love you. To your name be the glory, and to that we will not compete. We give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today. We love you. We'll see you this evening. Four to six, fall fest. I know you when you teach, and I pain you can't forget. And life will treat you better.